Hi guys, Buildzoid here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the RTX 2080 Ti Founders Edition PCB from NVIDIA. Um, and we're, we're, we're just going to dive right into it because uh, there's no point in talking about sort of stuff ahead of time that I'm going to address anyway. So then, let's start off with the VRMs, starting with the largest and most important one first, the vCore VRM, which is actually split into two separate parts. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermaltake and the View 71 enclosure. The View 71 is a full tower case that's capable of fitting three video cards in most configurations. It's also one of the better cooling cases in our recent case testing bench lineup. The View 71 has hinged tempered glass doors on either side that make it easy to open and show off, and it comes with at least one rain fan, though you can get the RGB version if you prefer. Learn more at the link in the description below. Um, so you have one half, well, it's not really a half because they're not the same size, but you have sort of one group of V-core phases over there and you have the other group of V-core phases over here. Above that, uh, above the larger V-core uh, v VRM, you have the memory VRM, so VMEM or VGDDDR or whatever you want to call it. Um, that powers the GDDR6 memory chips scattered uh, around the die. Um, up here you have what is probably the 1.8 volts rail. Um, this rail is necessary for uh, the GDDR6 memory chips as well as uh, NVIDIA's BIOS chips. They, they run off of 1.8 volts as well. Down here I assume this is for USB-C power um, because there is a USB Type-C port in the I.O. section of the GPU. Um, over in this area, there should be a PEX rail, though the PEX rail might also be here. I'm not sure. It's, it's hard to say without the card in hand. So the PEX rail is going to be located in this area, and there's also going to be a 5 volts VRM in that area as well. And the 5 volts is for powering the actual power stages because uh, those will not run off of 12 volts or 3.3 volts. And the PCIe slot only provides 12 and 3.3 volts to the GPU. So it's necessary for the GPU to generate its own 5 volts rail, and that's going to be happening somewhere over there. Again, I have a pictures of the card, not the actual card in hand, so... Hard to say which regulator exactly is doing that. Now then, um, let's get into the details on the vCore VRM, starting with the funky layout. Well, it's not really that funky, but it is a bit special. We've, you know, there's uh, the Titan V has a similar layout, um, but most cards generally you just have one strip of phases and they, they don't do this kind of two separate lines uh, layout. And there's actually a uh, kind of two major benefits to doing this layout. So first of all, it spreads the thermal uh, thermal load of the VRM across a much larger area. So instead of having, you know, all 13 phases crammed into one line or into, let's say, a rectangle of that, that size um, on this side of the card and having all of the heat concentrated in sort of this area, you have the heat of the VRM sort of, you know, spreading out over those sort of areas. And so therm that makes this slightly easier to cool. Um, so that's that's one benefit. And electrically, you get the benefit that with uh, your standard VRM layout, um, when you have a VRM entirely located on like one side of the card, like if we just ignored this one's existence, a issue with most cards that use that normal uh, layout is that you actually get voltage drop at the very high currents just from the power plane's electrical resistance. And that is so that that like at the really high currents, you're going to be looking at voltage drops where basically if you measure the capacitor on the back of the GPU core. So if we go here, Right, so on a lot of cards, if you measure the voltage on, let's, I'm not sure that this capacitor is V-Core, but I assume it's V-Core. Um, so assuming this one's V-Core, if you measured the voltage on this one and then measured the voltage on, say, this one, you would actually see a difference where this one would measure a couple millivolts lower. And depending on how much current you're pushing, that difference might be, say, 20, 20 millivolts or, or even more in some cases. So there's definitely... So with the layout that NVIDIA has, that's actually not as much of an issue because they're basically shoving voltage into the GPU core from both sides. And so the uh, area of the GPU core where your voltage will be lowered should be this line of capacitors right down the middle. Um, and so in theory, that gives you a slightly more even uh, supply of power to the GPU core and could lead to in better overclocking results compared to VRM layouts where you just have one strip of phases on one side. Um, 
Another reason why this may be done is just because of routing the power planes through the PCB uh, necessitates this layout to not, well, there, there have definitely been cards where you've seen like two rows of VRM phases, but that just like massively exaggerates that voltage drop issue over over distance. So this layout definitely has some benefits um, in, in that you basically get the voltage regulator as close to the GPU core as possible um, for all of the phases. So that covers that. Um, the, the oddball layout is actually like that. That's a really cool thing to see. And I think going forward for really large GPUs, we're going to see this kind of layout more and more often just because you need so much current and so many phases that this is the most reasonable layout to, to power them. Um, you can sort of see Vega doing the same kind of thing with the L-shaped VRM that it has. That's similar reasoning there. They wanted 12 phases and there's no, and if you put the phases in a line, then the power delivery from the phases to the actual GPU core uh, well, you, you take some power losses over the distance that you need to push the current. So yeah, um, that's, uh, it's a pretty neat, um, VRM layout we have here. Now in terms of actual phase count, this thing is an absolute, like, this is a mess as far as I'm concerned, because this has one, two, okay, let's not count the chokes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 power stages and 13 chokes for them. And the problem with this is um, the voltage controller on this card, which is for the vCore VRM, is this chip right over here. And that is a monolithic power systems MP2888. And that's a 10 phase. So I don't actually, uh, and the thing is, um, so right off the bat, you might be like, okay, so it might be like a six phase getting doubled, but there's no doublers on here. And NVIDIA, like the, the thing is, they have a lot of very fancy 12 volt power rail balancing circuitry on here. So I'm actually, so I have the sneaking suspicion that they do actually have all 10 phases hooked up. I just have no idea how, and there's like three, and I'm assuming that there's like three option phases that are being used for changing uh, power balance situations for the, the eight pins, making sure that both eight pins are pulling an equal amount of power is taken care of by the sort of extra three phases, and I'm not sure how that's hooked up. Um, what's definitely certain is this card can't have 13 phases interleaving. The voltage controller definitely does not support that. It's It only goes up to 10 phase output. But still, that is a very like uh, that. That is a very high-end voltage controller right there from Monolithic Power Systems. It suppo supports up to five megahertz switching frequency. Um, the power stages Nvidia is using only go really are specced. Like you can run them beyond that, but it's not recommended because their efficiency will go down the drain. Um, generally, the, you wouldn't want to run them above one megahertz. So. This is a very high-end, uh, you know, voltage controller. And actually, recent and up until recently, really getting a ten-phase voltage controller wasn't really possible whatsoever. Um, I think around two thousand, well, no, around the five uh, five thousand eight hundred seventy HD Radeon series. Uh, UPI semiconductor was actually making a twelve-phase controller, but those all stopped being like nobody. Uh, that thing got like that thing got, uh, stopped being produced. And since then, it's basically been only eight phase voltage controllers for high end applications. And more recently, with basically between Intel's Skylake Xeons, which pull an insane amount of power, and Nvidia, Nvidia's ginormous new GPUs on 12 nanometer, um, we like the 10 phase voltage controllers seem to be coming back because this is not the only one that I'm aware of. There's also one from Infineon. Um, that uh, also exists. So yeah, this this is a this is a high end part. That that's nice to see. Uh, has an I square C interface. Is uses PWM vid as uh, all Nvidia voltage controllers in re recent history have. Um, I am there's no public data sheet for the chip, unfortunately. So modifying this thing is going to be a pain. But anyway, so that's the voltage controller, and the end result is that I actually don't know how the phase phases are set up. I think there's 10 phases being interleaved, and then there's like three phases that come and go, depending on what kind of power balancing situation you're in. Um, also, they're probably going to be dropping in and out of being run just based on how much uh, for... for uh, 
like for for power capability reasons as well. But I am really like it, it's really hard to like I can't give you specifics because it's just like this is a really oddball VRM layout. Now then, for the actual power stages, we're uh, we're looking at Nvidia's favorite new power stage, the Fairchild Semiconductor FDMF thirty one seventy power stage. This is a seventy amp part. Um, there's actually a bunch of these new 70 amp, uh, power stages coming out right now. This is the Fairchild Semiconductor one, um, and it's actually a smart power stage, so it integrates things like thermal protections, overcurrent protection, um, current monitoring, temperature monitoring, all of that's integrated directly into the power stage, um, and that is then, you know, read back by the, by compatible voltage controllers, that's, that's like the special thing is like, uh, all of these extra features actually need support from the voltage controller itself. Um, and yeah, these things are incredibly powerful. Um, the only issue with them is that the entire data sheet is specced at 1.8 volts output. Um, so for, uh, power, so for actual VRM efficiency figures, I'm going to list both what they would produce, like heat what, that they produce at 1.8 volts output, as well as 1.2 volt, and then for 1.2 volts output, which is still above what NVIDIA is going to be running these cards on, stock voltage is going to be around 1 volt. Um, but for 1.2 volts output, I'm going to be scaling them down based on the international rectifier 3575 power stage, um, just because most power stages scale them very similarly, um, with lower voltages in terms of efficiency. So the, it like the, the lower voltage efficiency figures are like, they're very rough estimates. So yeah, keep that in mind anyway. So power efficiency for the GPU core, um, 1.8 volts, 1.2 volts, and uh, worth noting is that the VRM, like these power stages also aren't specced for switching frequency lower than 500 kilohertz. They are very efficient actually, even at 500 kilohertz. So the, these are these are really awesome power stages and I hope we get to see them used in more and more applications. Um, there's already some motherboards using these. Um, hopefully they start gaining popularity, especially since Nvidia is like, probably requiring the use of 70 amp power stages for all of their uh for some of their 20 series cards it might be possible that uh any board part like any add-in board partners for nvidia that also make motherboards might start using these on motherboards just because they're already going to be buying them just to produce nvidia gpus so then um let's start at what i assume stock current is going to be stock we're going to probably be looking at around so something around 200 amps and at 1.8 volts that would translate to about 20 watts of heat output at 1.2 volts you'd be looking at more like uh 16 watts of heat, heat output so that is very efficient um yeah that that is yeah i mean what did you expect it's 13 phases worth of 70 amp power stages um Assuming NVIDIA actually has the efficiency shaping stuff uh, set up correctly, these things are going to get absolutely great thermal results across basically the entire voltage range. Then for overclocking, I'm not sure that NVIDIA is going to give you enough power limit to go uh, this high, but um, 300 amps, you're going to be looking at about uh, 34 watts at 1.8 volts and probably about 27 watts at 1.2 volts. So this is where I think air-cooled and probably water-cooled overclocking will also top out. Then 400 amps, um, this is, I, I'd say, starting to get into sort of dry ice overclocking territory for these cards, um, which would also go up to, say, 500 amps. Water cooling may actually overlap somewhat into the 400 amp range. I'm not sure. Really depends on how much power limit NVIDIA gives these cards. Um, so 400 amps, you'd be looking at about uh, 50 watts of heat at 1.8 volts output and about 50, wait, no, reading the wrong page, 40 watts of heat at 1.2 volts output. So that's only like you know, that's only like 18 watts of heat on like this VRM at 1.2 volts and 22 watts on this VRM. So that should be like more than coolable, which just already tells you how ridiculous this VRM is like 400 amps and, you know, 40 watts and spread across this much surface area. This thing should run ice cold, even if you didn't have heat, like as long as it gets airflow, this thing should run ice cold. It wouldn't really even need heat sinks and it's stock settings. This is massive overkill. Um, 
So yeah, very, very impressive. But it, in theory, this should go higher. So for 500 amps, um, which would, I think, be around where dry ice overclocking would top out, you'd be looking at about 68 watts of heat on 1.8 volts and 55 watts of heat on 1.2 volts. Now then, for LN2 overclocking, um, I must, I might, the, the current estimates here are guesswork based on how 1080 Ti's behave and then how much larger the 2080 Ti is than a 1080 Ti. Um, and the reason why I'm uh, estimating like this off of the 1080 Ti is because the 12 nanometer manufacturing process from TSMC doesn't really make much difference compared to the 16 nanometer manufacturing process from TSMC. Um, it's the same density, it's slightly more efficient, um, it might have more leakage. I not really, you know, it might have more leakage. It might have slightly less leakage. It's probably very, very similar to the the 60 nanometer process because it doesn't have a re really doesn't have a density increase. Um, it does seem to have slightly better, um, slightly better voltage frequency curves, but uh, it's not a huge jump. So I, I'm I'm assuming that an estimate based off of a 1080 Ti should be pretty accurate. So for LN2, you'd be looking at maybe like 600 amps, and I'm assuming around 1.5 volts. It might not scale that high. Um, and at 600 amps, this VRM would produce about 93 watts of heat. So at this point, we're really kind of getting out of the optimum range for the efficiency curve. As you can see, the current draw jumps are getting bigger and bigger. Um, and at 1.2 volts, you'd be looking more at like 75 watts of heat. So, you know, still should be very hand manageable if you have enough airflow over the VRMs. And then 700 amps, again on LN2, and it, this should actually be possible to hit if this behaves like a 1080 Ti. Um, you'd be looking at about 125 watts at 1.8 volts and about 100 watts at 1.2 volts. So since on LN2 you'd actually be sort of around 1.5 volts, maybe 1.4 volts, it would actually be somewhere in between uh, the these two figures for the VRM heat output. And that would get very, very hot. But if you had like a you know high enough RPM delta fan and maybe some kind of heat sink sitting on top of the VRM, it, on top of the MOSFETs, it should still be manageable. So, especially since you're just going to be like, it's just going to need to take that amount of current for the duration of a benchmark. It's not like you're going to be running that current into it for hours and hours and hours, which would uh, mean you'd need a much more substantial cooling system. So, yeah, this VRM is incredible. Like, it's really impressive. Uh, that is for sure. And it is definitely, in fact, this is the most powerful VRM NVIDIA has ever put on any consumer GPU. This VRM here is more powerful than the VR than the two V-Core VRMs on a GTX 590. Um, this is more powerful than the, the two V-Core VRMs of a GTX Titan Z. Um, the only VRM that NVIDIA makes that is more powerful than this is the one used on their like um, Volta 100 series cards and I think the Pascal 100 cards as well because those are like compute accelerators and those are absolutely massive. And those are the only cards that I can think of that I think have, uh, well, no, the Titan V is the only that I know for sure has a more powerful VR, VRM. And the Tesla's based, uh, the Tesla's use the same PCB as the Titan V. But as far as consumer cards go, NVIDIA hasn't made one with a more powerful VRM than this. Um, and honestly, like, I, I welcome this because this is a founder's edition where it's like, you, you know, this would actually be the bit. This is one of those cards where, like, the number of power connectors is actually a bigger problem than the the VRM itself. Um, so, yeah, this this is a very very impressive VRM. And in fact, if I was taking this on LN2, I'd definitely be hooking up more power connectors because uh, th this in this is a huge die. If it scales to the same voltages and clock speeds that you know the 10 series did. Uh, this thing is going to pull an insane amount of power, but at least this time around, like the, the, the VRM is definitely ready for that. Um, so yeah, very, very impressive PCB from NVIDIA. Um, and this is, this is one of the few I don't have anything to complain about on. Um, well, actually already with the 10 series, NVIDIA really stepped up their PCB quality. And this is just like, uh, at this point, it's like the board partners um, are going to have a hard time designing anything significantly better than the reference cards. 
Um, and honestly, if you're like considering water cooling or something, then I would just get a Founders Edition. I wouldn't worry about getting a custom card whatsoever because I... The, there's nothing I can really see here that it'd be like, yeah, there, there's going to be a significant upgrade if you got a non-Founders edition. That's just that's just not going to happen. Um, th this is already so freaking up there in terms of VRM build quality that you know we might like we will be seeing uh, custom board like custom cards from board partners with 16 phase V core VRMs, but it's like at that it's not really going to make a difference for your regular overclocking and it might have some improvement on ln2 but even there it, it really might not because this 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 is a 10 phase in terms of interleaving and it is crazy powerful uh crazy powerful so yeah i'm i'm very impressed with this um very very nice vrm from nvidia right here now then, moving on to the memory VRM, this is just more of the same, same power stages. Again, the FDMF uh, 3170s uh, from Fairchild Semiconductor. And so these are massive overkill. And this is a three phase, and it is controlled by this chip over here, which is yet another uh, M monolithic power systems MP2888. Which, uh, in my opinion, this is, uh, well, that, that's an odd choice because NVIDIA has other voltage controllers that they could have used right there. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with using the, the most high-end voltage controller compatible with your cards for, for basically everything. So the memory VRM is absolutely massive overkill. And uh, from reading some Micron uh, GDDR6 uh uh, product briefs and just information from Micron on GDDR6, the memory system on a 2080 Ti should pull around, well, the, the memory chips themselves should pull around 30 watts of power, um, which really isn't that much, especially considering that you have like, you know, 210 amps of peak output, uh, maximum output capability on the memory VRM. So the memory VRM is ridiculous overkill. Um, really, this this VRM should stay in the single digit heat output because at 20 amps output, um, you're going to be looking at around two watts of heat, and at 40 amps output, you're going to be looking at about 3.5. Um, and the GDDR5 and you know the GDDR6 uh, is not actually going to pull 40 amps, though it might scale with voltage if it behaves like GDDR5X. Like GDDR5X scaled all the way up to like 1.5 volts. Um, on if you had it on liquid nitrogen on air cooling you could reasonably push it to like 1.42 ish without too much risk in theory um, and it would scale to that but it's still memory system memory chips don't tend to massively increase in power consumption even as you raise the voltage and operating frequency which is kind of weird about them but it's like I've, I've checked it and it really doesn't like you you can crank up the memory frequency on a lot of say gddr5 by say 50 percent and it only makes like a 20 percent difference in power consumption so Memory is kind of weird like that, and the end result is that the memory VRM here is ridiculous overkill, and at stock, these chips will be running at 1.35 volts. So, yeah, that's, you know, the <laughs> more nice VRM right there. And now we get to the, the sort of the cool stuff, well, interesting things that NVIDIA has done around the card um, to try help with overclocking. So, there's these two uh, buck converter looking circuits, they're not actual buck converters, they're actually power balancing systems. Um, and uh, these are these are what I think is NVIDIA fixing a problem that NVIDIA very much created. So the problem that, uh, well, I'm not sure how much of a problem it is. I never really tested a ten, like a stock 10 series card that much, but NVIDIA runs a per power connector power limit system. And uh, if we think about this, the 2080 Ti has a TDP from NVIDIA of 250 watts. And NVIDIA's TDP very much means that um, because of how NVIDIA monitors their GPU's power consumption, when NVIDIA says TDP is 250 watts, that means the card will not pull more than 250 watts. And the reason for that is they have shunt resistors monitoring power going into the card on every single input. And um, so I assume this one right here is for one of the eight pins, I think. Uh, 
Um, if I had the card in hand, I could verify that, but from the pictures, it just kind of looks like that one probably is an 8-pin power connector. Um, 8 pin monitoring shunt and this one I'm gonna assume is also for an 8 pin um, and this one I think is for the PCIe slot so they basically monitor the power power going from you know every single 12 volt source on the card um, so the two 8 pins as well as the PCIe slot and the thing is Nvidia when they impose their power limits they might do something like um, you know 40 watts on the slot and then uh, 120 no that's too much 40 okay you know what let's just simplify this they might go like slot 50 watts and then the eight pins would be 100 watts each and then when you raise the power limit which in theory like i'm not sure that they'll even let you set it to 375 watts that would be like a lot normally the nvidia power slider goes to like what plus 10 percent maybe um but let's say they did let you go to 375 watts. So then you'd be looking at like 75 watts on the slot and then 150 watts for each of the power connectors. And the thing is, since you have this power limit per connector, it is actually possible for the GPU to be pulling 375 watts in a scenario where it's pulling 375 watts and it's trying to pull, say, 200 watts from one of the power connectors. And on a 10 series card, that would actually be something that could happen because of the uh, more basic power balancing system that they had. And basically when that would happen, the card would throttle because it would bounce off the power limit for the 8 pin that it's overdrawing. So to negate some of that, and NVIDIA has, has a new power 12 volt balancing system, which looks like that and that, and there's some other MOSFETs scattered around the card that I assume also have something to do with it because there's a lot of these 12 volt balancing um, control chips actually on the card. So the idea behind the 12 volt balance is basically if the, if the card starts going out of spec on one of the power connectors, the circuitry here can actually switch which power connector is providing power, uh, switch some of the phases from one of the eight pins to the other eight pin in order to get them back un into balance. And that would prevent the uh, card from bouncing off of the per connector power limit before it hits the total GPU power limit. So you basically kind of get a more, uh, you basically get more power, uh, more usable power limit than on a 10 series card. Um, the thing is, if NVIDIA just, at least from my perspective as an extreme overclocker, see, this 8-pin can perfectly fine handle 300 watts, and this one can too. And so, as far as I'm concerned, the power limit for this GPU should be more like 600 watts when overclocking, and uh, the per-connector power limit should be like, you know, well, let's, let's say 650. Um, none of the phases should be, like the V-Core phases should just not be hang off, hanging off of the PCIe slot. And so 50 watts would be for the PCIe slot and then 300 watts for each of the power connectors. And uh, NVIDIA, as far as I ha know, has never done this just because it, technically you're violating the PCIe spec. But if you actually look up the specification for these 8-pin uh, power connectors, uh, they, they can take 300 watts just fine. Um, that's not a problem. The only issue that would you could run into is if somebody's running like a daisy chain power connector. Um, yeah, they might over they they would overload that daisy chain because you'd be pulling like 600 watts through it. Um, but I think honestly, Nvidia could just have a disclaimer like, hey, if you want to raise the power limit this much, you need to rewire your GPU, or you run the risk of melting your power connect, uh, melting your actual cables. Um, which would then potentially lead to a fire if you have a crappy power supply without working over current protection. Um, and they do make those. <laughs> so yeah, it's just like, it's cool that Nvidia, you know, is freeing up more of the power limit by making sure that you don't bounce off of the per connector power limit as much as you used to be, as much as it used to happen on the 10 series. Um, I'm still not like, I still think they should have just given you a higher power limit. Anyway, for the 12 volt balancing, they're actually using a UPI semiconductor, uh, UP7, uh, 651Q. And the other complaint I have for this sh chip is that it doesn't have a public data sheet, but the description very clearly says that this thing has overcurrent protection. So in theory, you might run into a situation where like you say you modify the, the shunt, uh, the shunt resistors by either stacking uh, more shunts on top of them or just completely replacing them. Um, 
And then you'd still hit the power limit of the 12 volt ba balancing circuits instead of the, the shunts. So yeah, and also speaking of the shunts, NVIDIA has changed the chips it uses for monitoring those. They are now, instead of using the Texas Instruments INA3221, uh, they have the current monitoring done by NCP uh, 45491s. And these are actually four shunt, uh, four shunt monitoring, like they can monitor four shunts each. Um, and these don't actually output an I2C, uh, these don't have an I2C interface or anything like that. They spit out a differential signal that then goes into a analog digital controller of some kind that, you know, NVIDIA basically chooses. It might be fed right back into the GPU core, I'm not sure. But basically this converts the uh, high voltage, the high voltages it measures across the shunts into low voltages that can be read back by, you know, low, low voltage uh, analog digital converters, like what you would have, say, on the GPU core or on some other chip sitting somewhere on the PCB. And these are much faster than the INA3221, and those are also part of the, you know, rebalance, uh, like the upgrade to the balancing circuitry and the power monitoring circuitry uh, from NVIDIA because on the previous cards, you know, you would just basically have like a percent TDP indicator. Now you're going to have an actual uh, power draw ind uh, indication because of the, the changes they've made to the power monitoring system. And also the 12 volt balancing is now faster thanks to these. Um, the problem I have with these is that these have a bunch of tiny little SMDs. So modifying these is a bigger pain than modifying the INA3221s for higher power limits. So on these cards, I would honestly recommend that if you want to lift the power limit and you're going to be using a soldering iron to do it, you're going to want to put like a one, uh, if you want to really blow up the power limit, you're going to want to like, you put a five milliohm shunt on here. So that's 0 0.005 ohms on top of the existing shunt, you're going to get a twice, you're going to get twice as much power limit. So instead of like the 150 watts, you would get 300 watts on the eight pin, assuming that you can even set it to 150 to start with. I'm not sure. Um, and if you wanted to really blow out the power limit, like say if you were taking the card on liquid nitrogen or dry ice, uh, you would actually like, I would go all the way down to like a 0 0.015 ohm shunt and the reason for that is is if you actually put that in parallel with a five milliohm shunt you're going to get like a resistance of like 0 0.011 the um and so then you're going to get a roughly five times increase in power limit at which point even if you were at stock you know which is 250 watts well 250 watts times five is what 1250 watts power limit um total for for the card so then you shouldn't have a power limit, though you would have to probably add some extra power connectors because uh, the eight pins, they're good to 300 watts. They can even, if you have a power supply with 16 gauge cabling, you can even actually push as much as 468 watts through each of these. But um, the thing is, uh, you know, a thousand watts is actually even more than that. So you would really want to add some extra power connectors and if you were doing that, you'd have to add two of them because I'm not sure how the 12 volt power planes are actually internally wired on the card. And uh, like, you know, in theory, you could get away with three power, uh, three power connectors total. But since there's only two to start with, it's going to be hard to wire up a third one. So you'd have to wire up two to just keep it even. Um, yeah, so... That is the 2080 Ti Founders Edition. Um, you know, really solid PCB. Um, on LN, like, VRM is in my, like, similar to the 1080 Ti, this VRM is actually adequate even for, like, LN2 overclocking. So if you're on water cooling or air cooling, you have nothing to worry about except how high is the software power limit. Um, and if you want to modify that, you can just solder, you know, shunts in parallel on top of the existing shunts and that solves that issue um it's like the 12 volt balancing stuff like i know i complained about it but it's still from an engineering perspective that's a really cool thing to do because it does mean that you know they closer follow the specifications for the eight pin power connectors though i think you know you could just ignore those up to a certain point you can kind of ignore that um but yeah, very, very solid, you know, PCB from NVIDIA. And as I said, you know, it's like, it's going to be really hard. Like, in my opinion, PC, like, th th there's not much room for the add-in board partners to make a much better PCB. Um, 
for extreme overclocking, I would actually value the addition of like a third 8-pin power connector, which I think uh, I've seen some cards that might be doing that. Um, getting an extra 8-pin power connector for LN2, that would make sense. But for like daily usage, you can just buy a Founders Edition and knock yourself out. Like th there's not much to improve on here, right? Like you get a really, really solid vCore VRM, massive overkill on the memory VRM. Uh, the the new 12 volt balancing stuff which i don't really care about <laughs> and yeah there's i mean what's not to like um this, this is a really 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 solid card so yeah that's it for the video and uh thank you for watching like share subscribe if you have any comments questions suggestions you can leave them down in the comment section below and if you'd like to support gamers nexus there's a gamers nexus patron uh patreon and you can find that down in the description below there's also store.gamers.net uh store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to buy shirts or mugs or any other kind of merchandise and then uh if you'd like to watch more overclock like really overclocking focused content i have a channel called actually hardcore overclocking where i do overclocking stuff and also some electrical sort of engineering things here and there but mostly just overclocking so yeah that's it for the video thank you for watching and goodbye